September and the back to school and the traffic. But September also means that Reverend John is back with us. So all those assignments that you thought you could scull for the month of August along with all your summer activities, <laughs> game over. <laughs> New day now. It's my pleasure indeed to welcome Reverend John back and to celebrate with him his presence here and the wonderful insighting information and the way he packages it that he's going to bring to us this morning as he does every, every time he speaks. Reverend John, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'm dragging myself feet first into the 21st century, but I still have carried my hard copy with me. <laughs> oh, me of little faith. Good morning, Temple of Light family and friends. It is a joy to be back. You miss me? Thank you. And welcome to those joining us in consciousness on the World Wide Web. I was away for a full month, and it's been the first full vacation I've had since I was licensed as a Minister of Religious Science in 2003. I'm still not in the rhythm of get up in the morning and get to work by 9 o'clock. I'll get there. I'm so grateful to Reverend, Reverend Ann Shand, who acted in my absence, ably supported by Reverend Sonia Davidson, and to all of you for keeping the Temple of Light light shining, and to all of those of you who are also away, enjoying yourself um, abroad on leave, welcome home, welcome back. Reverend Michael was away too, actually, for August, so welcome back, Reverend Michael. Lovely to have you with us. My encouragement, as I call my messages, is titled, You Can't Walk the Second Mile Until You Have Walked the First. I tried to walk every day when I was in the grill. A mile on a sandy beach is good exercise. I once read, though, an amusing anecdote about the 19th century American philosopher and essayist Ralph Waldo Emerson. According to the story, the Concord sage, as he was known, and a young lad were faced with the, dif with the difficult problem of getting a, a, a young calf into a barn. Now, anyone who has had experience trying to get an animal, a calf or a donkey, to do something they don't want to do knows what they were up against. The boy tugged on a rope fastened around the animal's neck, and Emerson applied his shoulder to the calf's rump and shoved with all his might. But all the pushing and pulling Nothing was accomplished, and the calf maintained his status quo. As the sage and the boy huffed and puffed to no avail, an Irish maid servant came out on a neighbor's porch watching the spectacle and laughing long and hard. And then sauntering over, she dipped her finger in a pail of milk, stuck the finger into the calf's mouth, and without effort led the happy animal into the barn. Whereupon, the story goes, Emerson walked into the house, wiping perspiration from his face and thinking deeply. Then he sat at his desk in his study and he wrote the following, quote, I love people who can do things, unquote. I, like Emerson, love people who can do things. And this church, is blessed with an enormous amount of people, a whole host of people, who not only can do things, but who regularly go the extra mile to give sacred service in our spiritual community. There's a story in Genesis, ah, there's a story in Genesis about the enormous dividends paid on going the extra mile. In that story, a woman went to the well to draw water, as the women of that time were wont to do. An older man asked her for a drink. Without hesitation, she lowers the earthen jar from her shoulders and gives the thirsty stranger a drink.
Then she figures that his camels must be thirsty and offers to feed them, to give them drinks of water too. Little did she realize how this act of generosity would change her life and the course of human history, really, the lives of so many other people. The woman was named Rebecca. She didn't know what the man she served, that the man she served was the chief servant of Abraham, or that he, Abraham, had sent her to find a bride for his son Isaac. According to the story, just before Rebecca arrived um, at the well, the servant stood by the well after his long journey and he prayed. The story is found in Genesis 24, verses 12 to 15. Quote, let it be that the woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink and I will give your camels to drink. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master." Unquote. Now the servant must have wondered, how many young people am I going to, young women are, am I going to have to ask for a drink of water before they offer to water my camels? It's no small offer, eh? It's not like offering somebody Shih Tzu a drink from a saucer when they come visiting. Um, a thirsty camel, and the servant had 10. A thirsty camel can drink 20 gallons of water. Let's do the math. 10 camels at 20 gallons of water equals 200 gallons. 200 gallons drawn with a five gallon earthen jar, which is, is itself, you ever see those monkey jars? Figure a five gallon jar. So f a five gallon jar for 200 gallons makes, means 40 trips from the well. 40 trips at a conservative three minutes perhaps or more each equals at least two hours. So what seemed like a simple offer of kindness would have taken Rebecca at least two hours and a lot of woman power to fulfill. But you know, friends, I want you to know that I'm here at this temple at all hours of day and night. And sometimes I marvel at the time and effort, not to mention the expense, that those who volunteer at our center put into making our services and other activities so spiritually rewarding and successful. Take the apparent simple business of Sunday morning refreshments. And I'm not suggesting that our hospitality ministry is watering thirsty camels, <laughs> you know? But it takes a great deal of time and preparation for this joyful interval of after-service fellowship. Or have you ever thought about the effort that goes into setting out the chairs, or collating the order of service, or arranging the flowers? And surely this morning they are glorious. Thank you. Please give her a hand. And then there are our musicians and those who check every Sunday morning to make certain that this, the restrooms are stocked with the proper amenities. The musicians practice for hours so that they can, they can play for us. Thank you, Steve, this morning and, and Valerie. Um, there's our environment ministry that looks after inside and out. There is the peace ministry. There's our Sunday school and youth ministry. All our ministries our Love in Action Ministries, the Ministry of the Word who mans the book room. All of our Love in Action Ministries go the extra mile on behalf of this center. And we, and sometimes even I take it for granted. You come and you expect to find the church beautifully laid out and everything as you expect it to be. But we just need to think sometimes it is a Rebecca deed. It is a deed that goes beyond what has been asked sometimes and takes a great deal of effort and man and woman power. Thank you. I forgot to mention our Ministry of Fund Development, and I just looked over and saw Grandpa uh, Norman. <laughs> um, and thank you to fund developers. We need lots of it, and you're going to be hearing the news very shortly of, of a whole program that's been developed by them for us. You see, there's an important lesson to be learned from Rebecca, and it is this. You can't walk the second mile until you have walked the first. 
It's easy for us to talk about the great and generous things we intend to do in the future, but if we're not being generous with what we have right now, it is unlikely that we'll suddenly change in the future. Someone recently said to me, I think they were trying to pull my tongue, and said, Reverend John, if I win the lottery, I intend to give 10% of my winnings to the temple. Would you accept it? Because, you know, of course, the, the, the churches here are against um, gambling. I said, certainly. But are you tithing from what the universe is giving you right now? Because we need to start right where we are to give. Rebecca started her service by first doing what was asked. She gave the stranger a drink. And only when she had completed that task did she take care of the camels. Likewise, we need to start giving now where we currently are, not somewhere over the rainbow on some distant day in the future. Which brings me to your assignment. Regulars at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living know that my encouragements always include an assignment. What you may not know is that when I give an assignment or teach a class, I always do the assignments first myself. If it is an ongoing assignment, such as a daily spiritual practice, I do it every day, just as I have asked you to do. In the case of my classes, I also go the extra mile and pray every day for each registered member of my class individually. Because you see, I learned from Rebecca that she didn't just give one camel water or a few and say to herself, there, I've had some. What do you expect me to do? Water the whole flock? You need to do what you have undertaken to do and do it full out, going the extra mile. So your assignment, should you decide to undertake it, is really a two-part assignment this morning. The first is to find a little quiet time today and make a list of the people who have watered your camels. The people, in other words, who have gone the extra mile for you. And then during the week, telephone, write, text, email, BBM, WhatsApp, Tango, or whatever them, and say, you know, you remind me of Rebecca in Genesis chapter 24. They will probably say, eh, huh? What do you mean? And then you can say, read the story, and when you have, when you have some time, like Rebecca, you always go the extra mile for me, and I want to thank you. The second part of your assignment is to ask yourself how you can go the extra mile for a friend, at your job, your workplace, for your church, for your community. It would have been so easy for Rebecca to have just done the minimum, the convenient thing to do. Before she made an offer, she undoubtedly thought about the time. She knew what she was offering to do. She thought about the effort and she may have thought about the sacrifice and the energy that she'd have to put in that was required of her act of generosity. Yet she did it anyway. Think about what you can give, what you can do, which goes beyond what you have been asked uh, to emulate the example of Rebecca. Her deed set her apart from all the other women who had gathered at the spring that evening. And as a result, her life changed in ways that she could never have imagined. Because according to the legend, she became the great to the 37th power grandmother of the Messiah. I thought about saying great, great, great 37 times, and I thought I would lose you. <laughs> Truly, when we give generously, we activate the law of cause and effect, and we receive more than we could ever think possible. In Matthew 7, verse 2, the beautiful Jesus says, and I quote, with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you, unquote. For truly, as we set the standard for what we receive, we set it by what we give. This, my friends, is the law. There's a lovely story that illustrates this. It's about a man who was driving his car one evening at dusk, and he saw a lady elegantly dressed standing beside her new Mercedes, looking desperate on the side of the road. He parked his Pontiac nearby and, smiling, approached her, but he could see that she was nervous. So he, he tried to calm her, her fears by saying, I'm here to help you, don't worry. My name is Brian Anderson. The tire was flat, and so he changed it and, of course, got dirtier than he was already. And when the job was done, she asked how much she owed him for his help. Brian smiled and he said, if you really want to pay me back, 
The next time you see someone who needs help, give that person the needed assistance and think of me." Unquote. That same evening, the lady stopped by a small cafe. It wasn't her usual kind of place. It was quite dingy, but she was hungry and she still had a distance to go. In the place, she saw a waitress, nearly eight months pregnant, wiping her brow with a towel. Yet the waitress served her customers with a sweet, friendly smile. And although she had spent the whole day on her feet, she managed to be pleasant to every customer in turn. The lady wondered how someone who was so little and so very pregnant could still be so very kind and giving to the customers. And then she remembered Brian. The lady finished her meal and paid with a $100 bill. And the waitress went to get change and her receipt. When she came back, the lady was gone. She left a note on the napkin, and I quote, you don't owe me anything. Somebody helped me earlier this evening, just like how I'm helping you. If you really want to pay me back, do not let this chain of love end with you, unquote. The waitress found four more $100 bills under the napkin. That night, the waitress came home earlier than her husband. She was thinking about the lady and the money and she, that she had left, and she was wondering how on earth could the lady have ever known how much she and her husband needed this, this gift, especially now when the baby would soon arrive. She knew that her husband was worried about that, and so she was glad to give him the good news when he got home. Honey, guess what? And then she kissed him and whispered, now everything will be all right. Nice story. And then as she turned off the bedside light, she hugged him and whispered, I love you, Brian Anderson. <laughs> you never know, do you? Never know, do you? Similarly, this is really just blowing my mind. I was on my way from Negril, um, toasted brown and rested. And the bus, we have to change buses in Montego Bay. And I wanted a cup of coffee, you know, those cups of, those machines that give you um, coffee. So it was $100 and uh, it's only silver. So I went to the little lady who sells tickets and said, can you change $100? And she said, no, I don't have any change. I'm so sorry. So I looked in my pocket. I had about $30 in silver, a 20 and a $10 coin. And this young man, young dread in the, in the, in the station said, here you are, and handed me a handful of, of silver. I said, no, 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 that's OK. He said, no, man, take it. You want a cup of coffee? At the same time, the cashier who I had asked had fought, gone in her bag and found uh, the money. And she came from around the back and said, here, I got it. So I was able to, to, change, to change the money with her. But I just thought, how kind of a young man who I don't even know. And you don't think about that kind of thing coming from young people. So I'm telling my housemate, Tony Henry, the story this morning. And it turns out to be a friend of his. You never know, do you? You never know. Let us affirm together, I lovingly give all that is mine to give. Together, I lovingly give all that is mine to give. I always go the extra mile. I give in love and receive with joy. Friends, there's another great spin-off in the Rebecca story. When we give, our loved ones and those close to us are also blessed. In the story, her mother and brother also received gifts from Abraham's servant. This is because there is always an overflow from generosity that blesses those close to the giver. And this is a, a story which uh, came back to me as I was writing this, and it's a personal story. When I was a teenager, my brother Dennis, who was four years my senior and at university, brought two Trinidadian friends home to spend the Christmas holidays with us. I wasn't amused because that meant I had to give up my bed and sleep on a cot, a camp cot, in the living room. So I complained to my mom, who said, yes, dear, but you know, they don't have anywhere to spend Christmas. They're away from home. And never mind, you'll get a special blessing for giving up your bed. Uh, it always comes back to you. I say, you're right. Am I getting the bicycle? You promised me, you know. <laughs> Fast forward to Christmas week, 1965. 
I was in Rome and on standby for a flight to New York. Also on standby was an Italian, Alitalia employee who had been visiting his parents in Rome and was heading back to work in New York. So we got talking as we waited, and finding that we had many interests in common, we bonded. At the last moment, and those of you who have ever been on standby for the airline know it's, it's nerve wracking because you're waiting there for the last moment. Um, and you have two types of employee, those that say, flight closed, no standby. And you are left there saying, oh my god, I've spent my last hundred dollars you know, on that bag that I shouldn't have bought. Or you have those that say, so sorry guys, um, there, is, there is no space on this flight, but there is lots of space on the flight tomorrow morning, which was the one that we had, who said, we'll try and get you all on tomorrow, or get you both on tomorrow. So I'm there contemplating spending the night on the rather hard benches at Fumacina Airport, because I had spent my last hundred dollars on that bag which I shouldn't have bought, which I still have. And he turns to me and he says, you don't have anywhere to stay tonight, do you? I said, I can't afford the, the price of the air, airport hotel. And he said, you're quite welcome to come and spend the night at my parents' house. My mother loves to have strangers and to meet people from abroad. And so I went home and was dined, and rather fed and watered, or wined royally. And then it was time to retire. And his little brother, gave up his bed. This is the truth. The picnic spent the night, yes, on a camp cot in the living room. <laughs> Dr. Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this great teaching, known as the science of mind, writes in The Law of Giving, and I quote, Everything in nature moves in circles. Just remember that, friend. Everything that goes around comes around. There are cycles of completion. What goes out must come back. And oh my god, sometimes it comes back like a boomerang with much more force than it went out. Holmes says, unless the seed is sown, it cannot bear fruit. There must be a planting time for every harvest. Who gives all, receives all. Who refuses to give, limits the possibility of the greater good returning to him, and I add, or her. Friends, we do not give because God needs the gift, but because the giving increases, broadens, and deepens the life of the giver. And all of you who serve this church with such love and such dedication, just remember that. It's deepening and broadening and lengthening and joyously filling your life. The giver, you cannot outgive the universe. The universe refuses to bargain with us. It has already and has already given everything it has. But it also has provided that the gift of life can be received in its fullness only as it flows out through us to enrich the lives of others. Let us say, today I receive the gift of life in all its fullness. Together? Today I receive the gift of life in all its fullness. I let it flow freely through me. I let it flow freely through me and out to enrich the lives of others. And out to enrich the lives of others. To your neighbor say, thank you for sharing the gift of life. Namaste. Thank you for sharing the gift of life. Namaste. I said, your neighbor, not the whole church. When we give the gift of ourself, the gift of life, when we share our time, talent, and treasure, when we go the extra mile in service to others, the impact of our generosity outlives us. Thank you for sharing the precious gift of yourselves. Namaste.